Welcome to the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast, where we're joined by your hosts, Tanya Gomez and Paul Bryan. In each episode, we'll be sharing valuable insights and tips to help you turn your NDIS business into a profitable venture. So whether you're just starting out or looking to take your business to the next level, you've come to the right place. Let's stop surviving and start thriving. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Profitable NGOs podcast with Paul and Tanya. And this week, we are back with our good friend, Deb, from NGOs Property Australia to talk all things about SDA growth in Australia. Welcome, Deb, and welcome, Paul. Hello. Great to be back. Hello, hello. Good to be here. And thank you so much for coming back again, Deb. Um, had a great time chatting about, you know, what is SDA previously and, you know, uh, I guess demystifying some of what that is and what all the bits and pieces are. So today we're going to get a bit more into the growth of it, mm-hmm. which is, uh, you know, obviously looking into the future, that crystal ball of the NDIS and uh, getting a bit of a better idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to it. Before we begin on that, Deb, do you want to give us a little bit of background of uh, of your business, of NGOs Property Australia, who you are and what you do, and anything else you wanted to share about your expertise in this space? Yeah, sure. Okay, so NDIS Property Australia are a, a real estate agent, uh, but we work exclusively in the NDIS world. So we connect investors with builders and developers uh, and with providers to create specialist disability accommodation. In a nutshell, that's what we do. We hmm. um, we educate, we advise, we consult. So we also have a podcast ourselves, the SDA Housing Podcast, where we talk about everything SDA. And so, yeah, we, we just, our aim is to help Australia build SDA because there is such an undersupply and such a demand around Australia for it. And it is a is a really tricky thing to navigate how to do this. Yeah, I know. Uh, last time we spoke, uh, you definitely cleared up so much of the information around, you know, what all those moving parts are. Um, so I'd love to know, like, for someone thinking about becoming a SDA provider and moving into that space, um, what are the sort of current growth trends and markets that they would be moving into? What what are they looking at? Well, I guess from a perspective of where the gaps are in SDA, um, from our perspective, there are gaps everywhere. There are um, there is still such a, an undersupply. People people look at it at the figures that the NDIA put out and say, "Well, there's there's too many here and there's not enough there." But when you look at it in terms of just the new build SDA. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the properties that are attracting these new funding levels for the participants. There are roughly around 17,500 places in deficit Australia-wide. Yeah, wow. So that is, we could say that's another eight to 10,000 properties that still need to be built to meet the current demand. And that's without additional participants being funded. So I'm talking about if if you were to look at all of the existing and legacy properties around Australia that fall under the SDA banner, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of those, are, or most of them eventually are going to be defunded and the tenants are going to have to move out of them into new build SDA. But yeah. there is such a huge undersupply at the moment. So they can't go anywhere because it's just, just not yeah, there. Okay. So even if you look at the stats and there are, for example, um, in an area, um, you know, 100 participants living in SDA and you've got 20 looking for a new SDA, mm-hmm. half of those participants could be in these old properties. So they might not be looking now, but they will need in five years' time yep. or seven years' time, they will need to move somewhere. And that's where we need to be looking at in that growth. So pretty much the growth is everywhere. But of mm-hmm. course, there are pockets where there has been overdevelopment, certainly in different um, certain designs of SDA. Yep. Um, 
what I'm talking about there is the, the four different categories, improved livability, fully accessible, high physical support and robust. So we know mm-hmm. high physical support has been the, I think, 57% of all new dwellings right. are built to high physical support. Um, and we probably have about 8% built to robust. Right, so, okay. And we know we need a lot more robust and we don't need all those high physical support. We need a lot more in the middle there. Yeah, so I guess is that um, – it, it, do they do people look at it as, the you know, the high physical support is like a, a safer investment? rather than a robust or how does that happen like that? Well, firstly, they look at it with the dollar figure in mind, the investors. The high physical support attracts the higher income levels. Yeah. So that's what (laughs) they build. And that's what's offered. That's what the builders are building. Um, We don't have a problem with that because people with improved livability and fully accessible funding can live in a high physical support home. Yeah. But the investor won't get the same income. Yes. They'll only get what the participants funded for. Right. As long as the investor is happy that, they may not have those higher levels that they can potentially get, mm-hmm. then that's great. Build them yeah. all to high physical support. Just be aware of what your realistic in- incomes are going to be because so 57% of SDA participants won't be high physical support funded. Yeah, is, right. Is the idea around that, because I was trying to think that through, is the idea that high physical support is the highest level? So by going the highest level, you can accommodate everyone as opposed to going the middle of the range and and missing people who might have that funding. Is that why that's the case? Yes and no. Um, Just with the high physical, you can't have people with robust funding in that house Mm -hmm. unless you build it to hybrid, which is starting to become a bit more common now. The builders are, are designing homes that will have all the high physical support Certification right. and robust certif- certification yeah, so you right, can have okay. 100% of participants can live in that dwelling. Um, but I, it, it, like I said, it comes mainly down to the funding. That's what the investors want. So that's what are being built. Um, but we also like to look at it that if you have a high physical support home but you've got a participant in there with fully accessible funding, a lot of these participants have degenerative conditions Mm-hmm. And in a few years' time, they may well need high physical support home and their funding level will go up. They're in the same home. They don't need to move out. Yeah. So that is a benefit of having a high physical support home to start and having lower funded tenants in there. They don't need to move out if they need to. And so I, I learned this from your podcast, so I, I, um, I, I don't know it as well as, as you do, but my my brief understanding of the difference between what be it high physical support and robust it is, I mean, it says it in the names kind of, but high physical supports, I'm thinking someone with a physical disability that has hoists and lifts and, um, you know, zero stairs as an example. And then robust, I'm thinking people who have restrictive practices in place and need thicker walls, thicker windows. It, is that kind of the difference? That's exactly it. Yeah. Right. That is exactly it in a I, nutshell. You yeah. taught me well. Your podcast is amazing. <laughs> I've talked about these design categories as an NRS auditor and I've heard about them for so many years, but there wasn't – I really had no idea. I was like, just read the price guide and the calculator. I don't know. Just I'm just approving you over here for your NRS commission process against these standards. I don't understand those, nor do I want to. It's it's a different language. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think – I guess also because SIL has become such a large – a, a large part of what I do and are such a large part of the NGS landscape mm. recently that the the terminology around robust housing has come into the conversations that I've been having around all of the damage that happens to sill houses because they aren't built to these type yes. of standards. They are just properties that someone has has rented or, you know, their their own homes that have been leased out and they aren't built to any kind of standard. Mm-hmm. I think it's, yeah, I think it's becoming more prevalent. The language is, is coming along. Mm, yeah, people definitely are getting more of an understanding of what, what they mean. Yeah. In a um, message, so someone with a physical a physical needs might not need robust housing and, and people who have uh, psychosocial disabilities or have uh, restrictive practices or behaviour support plans in place, they might not have physical needs. Exactly. 
I guess that that really does make sense as to why there's different categories in the, in that instance. Yeah, mm. precisely. Yeah. Mm. So I guess if if you're looking to be a provider and you know where you could fit into that is, um, you're probably already involved in supports somehow. Um, so you have an idea of participants and, and what their needs are and and what what the gaps are in the market where you're working. Um, so I'm not, you know, obviously moving into the provider, that's probably more your area, Tanya, but uh, um, look at where the gaps are. The NDIA put out some really um, detailed statistics every quarter on specialist disability accommodation. We go into, we do a lot of work on the research side of things, where the, where the data is, where the supply is, where the demand is. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, you know, we know it is everywhere, but it's just more specifically, I guess it's in the areas that are newer to the SDA, Western Australia, Northern Territory mm-hmm. have the, probably the biggest demand, um, because they're just a lot new. And so there's been a lot less development. So we're working a lot in those areas to get SDA built. Um, we know that there is a huge demand for robust I think a lot of that is potentially because the robust homes that were being built were multi-tenant yeah. properties mm-hmm. and 80% of robust participants can't share. Yeah. So they need to really have a single home. You know, so they're moving more into building villas, single tenant villas. Mm. Um, and I, I'm hoping I've heard little birdies say that with the new prices coming out, um, there might be single house funding for SDA for robust, especially. Right. Um, that, that that can change things, and that might encourage people to build robust more. Um, but from a provider perspective, um, yeah, look, it's the gaps are everywhere. You've just got to look at the research, yeah, the data, and and your contacts and and your networks, and and find out what they need and what they're looking for. We most of our most of our audience are providers, and they're you know they 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 might not necessarily be an SDA provider yet, but there's people who have gone through the process and are registered as, as an SDA provider. And I guess there's a lot of confusion about well, now what? I'm registered for it, mm-hmm. and and they may have a participant in mind. You know, maybe I guess this is what you call provider led um, uh, SDA. What, yeah. are, what is a provider's next steps? Do they come to you and help get an investor? Do they find a builder? What's the next step once they have this provider registration in SDA? Yeah, but either of those, very much so. Um, I guess find builders who are already building SDA, mm-hmm. um, come to organisations like ourselves who are selling it. Um, we're not a provider or a builder, so we it just – I think that that's where we kind of stand apart from most of the other organisations out there who are selling. Um, we sell all over Australia. We work with many, many different builders and developers. And and so wherever you are, you know, we potentially have the builders in our network to, mm-hmm. to do this. Um, and we're also always looking for providers who've got participants that need homes because we're trying to link everyone together. We're we're trying to find providers for our investors for properties that are in the pipeline or actually under construction. Um, we don't always have them everywhere we work. Usually the builders are connected as well, but um, you know the more collaboration, the more this works better for everybody. So yeah, absolutely, come to us um, or. You know, find other people selling. Find other, find the builders as well. Go direct to them. Yep. Oh, fantastic! Look, this is obviously like, you know, this is a place where people really need to know what they're doing. Like, if you're building any property, is it the right place? Is the right time? How does an SDA provider decide, you know, where to build a premises to make sure there's going to be enough participants and they're going to you know, get a return on their investment? Yeah. Uh, well, it's all down to that demand and. It's a bit tricky to – the demand we have a better feeling for with the NDIA mm-hmm. data, but what you really got to look at is the supply. 
and and the information put out is is fairly good in terms of current supply existing enrolled dwellings. When it comes to the pipeline information, what's under construction, it's much harder to get specific details. And mm. the only way really we really can do that is talking to the people on the ground, talking to the providers mm. in the area, talking to the builders in the area, what they know, who they know, what's going on that is not. So that's what it's about. It's networking. You know, I think a few years ago, SDA was very much a little closed kind of industry and people weren't communicating and they weren't collaborating and there was a lot of mistakes made and now people are learning that they need to share that information and and that's what I love about the conferences that we go to there is so much great information that comes out of that people are are really opening up and talking about all the different aspects of this all the different people involved in in SDA all the different kind of stakeholders so it's it's really talking to your networks to to get more of a a feel for what's actually happening and find what that supply is on the ground. Yeah. Before you know, you know, where the gaps are. You've got to determine where those gaps are to know if you're doing something right. If there's a gap there, then great, because you know there's already a demand and that demand is potentially just going to keep growing in the future. Now I I've I've seen and when I've been auditing people who want to be an SDA provider, I have seen, uh, I've audited a number of developers who also want to be the provider. Is that commonplace? Are there builders and developers who decide to be the provider as well? And how does that, how does that change things? There are quite a lot. There are a lot out there doing that. Um, they, yeah, they might have a lot of funding behind them, so they don't need investors. They want to put the money in because they see those returns, so they decide to become the provider and manage that themselves, um, which can be great as long as they work with the right people. They're working with the right SIL providers mm-hmm. um, and, and doing it the right way. Uh, obviously, we don't really have much interaction with those organizations because they're not looking to sell. Yeah their Mm -hmm. properties they don't need us um but you know i don't see a problem in that as long as they're not flooding the market which i think sometimes does happen they're just building without really um taking too much consideration of what's already there or what else is being Mm -hmm. put in there they just think oh we'll do this and build all these dwellings and hopefully fill them we're actually having some of them come to us now who want us to assist in in tenanting right, okay. their properties because yeah. they can see that they're going to have a lot in the pipeline. They're, they're in the pipeline and they'll, they'll start coming online in the next three, six, 12 months and they can see that potentially they're not going to get tenants. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. Mm. But how, how, how does a, provider or an investor feel certain about that area? Is it is it just boots on the ground, talking to people, speaking to support coordinators, finding out who's in that area? Is there, is there you know, I, I often think about um, McDonald's and how McDonald's are a property business, not a fast food business, and that they buy land and they have to be within, is, is it, I don't know exactly the criteria, but I know they have a criteria of how close to schools, how close to shops, how close to A, B and C before they will build there as mm-hmm. McDonald's. Is there a similar formula for SDA properties? Do you need to be walking distance to a bus stop, to a shop? Are you looking for places that are near disability employment type uh, providers so that there's job opportunities. How? How? Yeah. Are, are they? Are there simple things like that? Look, that is all really important. It's there's no fixed rules that they have to be in certain parameters, uh, but especially for the the three categories of of improved livability, fully accessible, high physical support, they really do need to be near public transport, near shops near medical facilities um yeah for a quality of life robust is because of the participants that are likely to be in a robust home sometimes it is actually better for them to be in a a, a more of a quiet 
rural area or, you know, just a more quietly suburban area where they're in a larger block of land. It doesn't have to necessarily be so close to the facilities because they may not be going mm. out without support. Or a lot of them wouldn't be anyway, but uh, uh, but certainly, yeah, you want to have them in the best location for the for the facilities around them as possible, but there's no specifics. It has to be within a couple of hundred metres, this or that. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, the, cool. the closer to to all of those things, the better for sure. Unfortunately, um, that's not where the land is that is affordable that people have been building on. So we've seen a lot of development going up in, in the new developments on the outskirts mm-hmm. of the all the big cities. Um, which just because there is nowhere else to build and the mm. demand is so huge, it's it's not ideal. But you know, take Sydney for example. There's there's such a demand in in the older established areas of Sydney. There's just you can't buy a property un, under one and a half million dollars, um, mm. let alone an empty block of land. So it, you cannot financially do it. And just yeah. through. SDA has to be a new build. Yeah. Uh, no. Yes and no. <laughs> it has to be what what is classified as a new build. Um, you can refurbish an existing property, however. Right. But the cost of doing that is, in most cases, not feasible. So the NDIA basically is saying, build it new. Yeah. We don't mm-hmm. want you to do a refurbish. It, for example, on the on a through the four bedroom three tenant home house category for high physical support, the minimum spend for a refurbishment I think is around about the six hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. right. And that's more to build a new home. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Again, I, I, ta- like- I take that as and saying no, nah, don't don't refurb, just build it new. Yeah. So, you know, a knockdown rebuild is probably a better option for people who've got existing land and and we work with a lot of people on on that option. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. Mm. So, I again, I I really appreciate your time. You've definitely cleared up a lot of those things around SDA and um you know, it's definitely one of those areas where you are looking into the future like you literally have to to know where things are going to be in a couple of years' time when the house will be ready. So uh, what you've given us today has been really insightful. Look, could you just give us your details about how anybody who's listened to the podcast today could get in touch with you and maybe get on that road to becoming a provider or an investor? Yeah. So easiest way to contact us is uh, email us at info, dot, so info at ndis.property. Or call us on one three hundred two five four three nine seven. Fantastic. We'll pop all those details in the show notes. So if you are listening, they'll be there available for you. Fantastic. That was that was really wonderful. I learned so much again. And I guess I would also like to uh, suggest that anyone looking at really moving into SDA, they jump over onto your podcast, they listen yeah. to the episode, especially the ones around the design categories, around the different mm-hmm. ways the the participant led, the investor led, the provider led journeys. They they listen to all the information you have about the different trends, in different places. They come along to some of the conferences and hear you speak about mm-hmm. this and really immerse themselves in this new network, this new language, this new side of things to really deeply understand it before they go um, and make a whole lot of mistakes and um, get themselves in a, a, a bit of a tricky situation. So I think well, everything that you do around the education side of things is so amazing and there's so much out there that you've made really simple and easy to access. So thank you for that and I uh, hope all of our audience jumps on there and um, listens to it as well. I know that I listened to most of the episodes. I was telling Min that I'm, I'm not that interested in the sprinkler ones, but I love all of the ones around the design standards. I think that it's really such a, a wonderful resource. Um, Fantastic. Glad to hear it. Yeah, thank you for joining us and for all you do in the space. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, thank you for having me again. It's been great. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. Next week we're going to be speaking to 
the uh, wonderful pink-haired lady, Karen Lorenzo, about the benefits of networking groups, um, what is out there as far as local networking groups and how they can get involved. So I'm really excited to be speaking to Karen, having her on our podcast. And um, thanks, everyone, again for joining us, and we'll speak to you soon. Awesome. Bye. See you later, guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast with Tanya Gomez and Paul Bryan. We hope you found today's episode informative and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to subscribe, leave us a rating, and share it with others who could benefit from our insights. Until next time, keep thriving.